Good morning. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a great weekend so far. Uh, Weather-wise, it's beautiful. Uh, it's beautiful today. And uh, for those of us who have the day off tomorrow, it's going to be a beautiful day again tomorrow. So, uh, so yeah, it's been, uh, it's been nice to have the warm weather with us. Um, as was mentioned, we're going to be continuing in our series on First and Second Timothy, uh, which we've called Fighting the Good Fight of Faith. And uh, we've had an introduction to the series two weeks ago. Last week on Mother's Day, we, uh, we had a message that was kind of focused on, we jumped ahead into 2 Timothy uh, for the sake of Mother's Day and looked at Timothy's heritage with the influence of his mother and, and grandmother and his life. And now today we're coming back into 1 Timothy and we're going to look at uh, verses 3 to 11 that was just read for us and in these verses we kind of we see a summary of of what of why Paul is writing to Timothy it's kind of summed up here in these in these initial verses um and you know we we live today in a world that is full of of competing voices uh competing voices competing worldviews ideologies uh, coming through many, many different platforms. Um, and these can, even today, influence the church and influence the teaching and the stances and the doctrines that the church follows and, and trusts in and presents from their pulpits. Uh, denominations have been based on such thoughts and such ideologies and uh, people choose what church they, they want to attend uh, based on the church structure, based on, you know, the church teachings, the church's mission, uh, vision, ideology. And some, some differences may be, you know, not really consequential, um, sort of considered not, not, not to be hills to die on is the, the term we kind of use. Um, but yet there are others that can really, uh, really distract us, uh, can really confuse us, even Christians, not just, not just people who may be looking into churches or, or just testing out the Bible and testing out Christianity, uh, but even Christians can come under and start questioning things in faith and teachings and doctrines, what is right, what is wrong. And there are some teachings that can confuse and even outright deny the truth that we see in the, the truth of the gospel that we find in the scriptures. And this is what uh, young Timothy was coming to face as his mission in the church in Ephesus. We saw in our introduction how following after Paul's first imprisonment, which was, which was more of a house arrest, and Timothy was with him during that, that uh, once he got released, him and Timothy would go on and, and visit some churches that um, that had been founded, some by Paul, um, and it seems as though once Paul got to Ephesus that there were some issues, issues that he found so striking and so, um, so in need to be dealt with that he left his most beloved, truest son in the faith, his, his right hand, the one he had the most confidence in, to stay behind. He, it, says, it says here in, in verse 3 that he urged him to stay behind. It wasn't necessarily a command, but it was clear that Paul really, really wanted him to stay behind and deal with these issues. Paul would then move on to Macedonia, uh, leave Timothy in Ephesus, but write this letter shortly after. And now we see the context as why Paul has left Timothy behind in Ephesus. And basically what I've, I've, I've called this this today's message, truth, law, and love. Um, I, I don't have, I didn't, I didn't prepare any slides, so you'll have to follow with me in, in the scriptures. We'll kind of be bouncing, we'll be staying and going through this, this passage in 1 Timothy uh, 1, 3 to 11, but I will be jumping into Ephesians at times and, uh, and quite a bit in Romans as well. Uh, and I've called it truth, law, and love because this is kind of what 
what we see in these verses. This is what's stand out to me. Um, and in fact, truth, law, and love is actually when we go, when you look through Paul's teachings uh, to Timothy in both letters, this is what Paul's focus tends to be on. Truth, uh, sound doctrine, sound teaching, uh, law, and not so much the, the law as in the Ten Commandments, but law as in, as in a way of doing things, structure within the church and within the Christian community. But ultimately, we see Paul's love. We see Paul's love for Timothy, Paul's love for the church, and of course, his love for his Lord and Savior. And so that's what we, what we see in this kind of uh, summed up or introduction, a second part of an introduction, if you will, into 1 Timothy, truth, law, and love. And these are the three things we're going to consider this morning. So as we read from verse 3, um, Paul says, I urged you when I went into Macedonia to stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. And then in verse 6, it says, Paul says, includes that some have departed from these things and have turned to meaningless talk. So we see the situation, what it is. And Paul's main instruction to Timothy is to put a stop to these three things, the false teaching, this devotion to myths, and uh, this focus on endless genealogies, things that are preventing this church from advancing God's kingdom. It's distracting them from it. It's, it's creating uh, controversies, disputes, division. And the first thing Paul lists is to, is to command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. Now, in order for there to be teaching of false doctrines, it means that um, it must mean that there is a true doctrine. There is a true doctrine that is supposed to be taught to be taught. And what it is in this case, as, as we read in verse 11, is that the true doctrine that is supposed to be being taught is the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and faith in that gospel, belief, complete trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that it is by faith and faith alone that you are saved. And so Paul is charging Timothy, and in fact he charges anyone who reads this, this passage, not only to preach true doctrine, the gospel, but to preach no other doctrine, anything that is outside of it, not to add to it, not to remove from it. And it must be preached in its purest form. Paul had wrote, written to the, he wrote to the Ephesians in, in, in chapter Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, he says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now the fact that the uh, Ephesian churches started down this path of false teaching and how it is coming into the church and it is creating controversies and, and questioning and people are unsure and there's instability. Um, it really shouldn't be a surprise to them. If you look in Acts chapter 20, verses 28 and 31, Paul is speaking to the Ephesian leaders at this point before he, before he goes on in the next steps of his ministry. And he says to the Ephesian leaders, as he's gathered with them, and he's, this is his instruction before he leaves them, he says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of by which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, three years Paul had been teaching them this, warning them this. For three years I never stopped warning each of you, night and day, with tears. 
and yet it still happened, and Paul has to leave Timothy behind. You know, some of the most dangerous false teachings are those that contain a bit of truth, those that may start with truth and then kind of manipulate it, distort it, often so subtle that it can even maybe even that it can even make a bit of sense, obviously. It makes a bit of sense in some way. Point of view of, of from a point of view, from a certain point of view or for or a context, it can even make sense. But those are the most damaging. Paul mentions here the one of the things that were leading him away from this, this truth into these false teachings of uh, for the truth of the gospel was that people were getting pulled into myths. Now the the myth in the in the Greek dictionary of the first century, when you look up the word, it pretty much means the same thing today. Uh, it means a tale, a legend, a story. But over time, it became a fictional narrative against a historical account of things. That's what a myth was when we read it here. This is what Paul is describing. They're not just false, but they were destabilizing. They, were, they, they didn't result in, in helping people plant their feet in the gospel. They promoted speculations, never ever amounting to any kind of firm knowledge or understanding. It's like having a, you know, it's like having an entire uh, conversation or discourse or, or seminary. We see promotions for, for seminars and seminaries with the CNC and coming up and it's like devoting an entire thing on unicorns or something. You know, like, well, there may be some who may find it enjoyable to talk about unicorns, like maybe my daughter, my youngest one. Um, you know, such types of things are, they won't amount to very much. It's just myth. There's nothing to ground yourself in. <clears throat> The use of stories that kind of lead us away from the truth are destabilizing. Paul mentions in 2 Timothy how these people who were seeking such, such types of, of stories, of fancy, of fairy tales, uh, just to get lost in these stories, were, were ever learning but yet never coming to a knowledge of the truth. It's like developing an, an obsession with an idea and trying to make it into a reality. I don't know if um, some, uh, any of you remember in the 80s this, uh, this craze of, of Dungeons and Dragons. It was a role-playing game. We didn't have much in the way of video games back then. Um, but we had this thing called Dungeons and Dragons. And it was a role-playing game that took people down dark paths. Teenagers, the ones who mostly got into it and obsessed with it, and they got so obsessed with this game, this, this fantasy world full of stories and uh, dark, dark things, um, that it became very real to them. In fact, it became so devastating, this, this role-playing game, that it is believed that even it was linked that there were suicides in young, in teenagers, and murders that were linked to this, people getting caught up into this mythical world of darkness. Even some of, uh, some of the subtle messaging and even some of the modern Disney movies can pull people away from the truth of the gospel. But not all fiction is bad. Fiction as a way of leading people to the truth is, is found in the scriptures, in the Bible. Jesus told parables. He told stories, stories that people could understand, but with the ultimate goal of revealing the spiritual truth. So fiction is good. It's, it's, it's used in the Bible itself. But when it pulls us away from the truth when it pulls our focus, when it pulls our attention from our faith in Christ and into something else, from our identity in Christ and puts our identity into something else, it is pulling us away from our faith 
and from our relationship and the truth of the gospel. It says that Paul says that these, some of these teachers were also making great deal fuss about genealogies. They were laying, putting stress on, on the ancestry and who these people were and their identity and their, in, their, um, in their history, their family ties, who their parents were, who their grandparents were. But our identity as Christians in the gospel is to be in Christ, not in anything else, not in anyone else, including ourselves. Our identity is to be found in Christ through faith. Timothy is charged to do this, to stop this, um, this false teaching. Does mean that these teachers were completely blatant heretics. They were probably men from the congregation who in many ways were good teachers, but were beginning to introduce ideas that may have been coming up at the time. As some believe it may have been Greek philosophy at the time that was starting to make its way, mythology, myths from, from, um, from Greek uh, mythology, um, and others claim that it was Jewish philosophies as well that were being brought in as, uh, to mix it up. At the church at the time, you had Jews who were bringing in Judaism and the legalism of Judaism into the church, but you also had Gentiles who were bringing in their paganism into the Christian, Christianity as well. So it's a whole, a whole mix that was found in the early church. And yet Jesus warns us to watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, clothing but inwardly are ferocious wolves. We see that in verse 7, when we look at the law, we see that it looks like it was the Jewish influence with the law and the legalistic approach to keeping the law that was affecting these false teachers that was being brought in. This is no different in the church today. Uh, people bring in new ideas, new strategies, new teachings that that modify, that, that stretch, that can even take away from the gospel. That leads to controversy. That leads to, to questionings. And when you think of controversial speculations that Paul mentions here, um, <clears throat> it's, it's this idea of having to question your faith, question the very truth that you are called to believe in and that does not advance God's work verses 7 to 11 we see that um, that Paul is focusing on those who are trying to bring in the law and verses 9 and 10 we see Paul actually using labels that are found from the Ten Commandments And what Paul is showing here in verses 7 to 11 is the the purpose of the law. And the law serving two purposes that I want us to to consider. Um, First of all, the law defines sin. It tells us what is morally right and wrong. If we say that there is a truth that is to be taught, well, we need to know that truth, right? We need to... uh, We need to know the rules of the road before we learn how to drive. You can't just send people out driving all over the place without without understanding the rules of the road. You need to see the speed limit. You need to see the speed limit sign to know how fast you are allowed to go. You need to know the rules of any kind of game or sport that you want to play in order to play it. And life is, is no different. God has created mankind to have order, not to live in chaos and doing whatever we please, however we want, when we want, with no rule, with no, uh, with no absolute uh, truth or, or of, of morality and what is right and wrong. God has created us to have order, and he has established his order, his plan, his rules for us to live by. Now, the first six labels you see in verse 9 refer to the first half of commandments. They're tied to, to, um, 
to commandments in relation to our relationship with God and how we work, how we interact with God, um, being unholy, irreligious, lawbreakers, rebels. And the last part deal with, of, of 9 and 10, the last uh, of these labels deal with how we interact with each other. The sexually immoral, murderers, liars. And so what Paul is referring here, he's referring to the Ten Commandments. He's referring to God's Judaic law. And he says that it is good. The law is good if it is used properly. Both the law and the gospel are relevant and good because they both represent God. So what is the role of the law in the age of the gospel? And this is the second, what I believe to be the second role, the second purpose of the law, and that is to reveal our sinfulness and to reveal our need for a savior. Paul helps us understand in, in verse 8 and 9 when he says that the law is for the lawless. We see that the law is not for the just. The law is not for the just. That's because the law cannot justify you or me or anyone else before God any more than that speed limit can pay our speeding ticket or that parking sign that we misread uh, can pay the parking ticket that we got. The law was given to point out to us that we, as a race, as mankind, have come up short and to show us our need for a Savior. Romans 3.10 reminds us that there is no one righteous, not one who is righteous, and that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible says that it's not that sin is not something we do, but rather sin is what we are. We are not sinners because we sin. We are sinners, therefore we sin. And so God's law stands over us and binds us as lawbreakers. And that is why we need another solution, to be found right in the sight of God before our Creator, and Romans 8, 3, and 4 reads this, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, meaning that the law cannot justify us, because the law was weak and could not justify us. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemns sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. If God's verdict changes on us from guilty to innocent, it's because of Christ's righteousness, not because of our attempt at keeping the law, but it's because of the Spirit of Christ that works in us. <clears throat> Romans 10.4 says that Christ is the culmination of the law. It's the end of the law. So that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. <clears throat> you know, often what passes for, um, for spirituality is, is really just legalism. It's, it's an easy trap to be, to be lured into. The idea of having a, a to-do list uh, is sometimes easier for someone to, to relate to and, and to understand, more so than obeying the, the nudge of the Spirit when it comes time to make a change. For us today, it may not be the, the specific Ten Commandments. Uh, it may not be this list of things that, that we see Paul writing but it can be other things. It can be, it can be things like, like uh, feeling the need, the obligation to, to attend, to be here on a Sunday, to be involved, to, to, to Bible reading and prayer. The, these things can be just as legalistic as what we see in the Ten Commandments. Um, there was uh, one of the things that, 
Fiona and I have struggled with, that have, we've had difficulties with, and I know that there are others who have had such difficulties, is having our, our children grow up, and once they reach to a certain age, um, they've made that decision uh, not to follow God anymore. Um, and, um, and it's, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it hurts us. It, you know, it, it really affects us. And it comes to a point where you, they're, they're coming to a certain age and they're coming to church with you every Sunday. And it comes to a point where they start dragging their heels on a Sunday morning and they kind of don't want to get out of bed and they kind of fight it. And you have to come to that point where you ask yourself, what are they doing? What am I doing as a parent? Am I forcing my kid, forcing my kid to come to church when the Spirit of God hasn't spoken to them? It's just as legalistic as trying as as what we see here that's an, a legalistic approach is trying to make them force them to come to church when the spirit of god hasn't come that's a work what we are promoting what we are preaching to them by doing so um, is basically a works-based faith but if we have placed that faith in christ jesus we can be assured that that law any kind of law has no power over us. It, has, it doesn't condemn us. And even though we may fall short, we have been released from this law through faith in Christ and his righteousness, not any kind of righteousness we want to try and live by in our life. And this takes me to, to the last point, and that is, uh, that is love. You know, the, the, the truth, uh, the law... Uh, even the law, especially the law, is rooted, uh, the foundation of these is in love. The foundation for fighting the good fight of faith in our life is love. It's love. Paul asks Timothy to stay in Ephesus. Um, and as Peter mentioned uh, last week, um, Timothy seems to be kind of a timid kind of guy. And yet Timothy is supposed to confront these men who are promoting these teaching. And if these men are promoting these teaching, we can maybe assume that, um, that these are men who have quite a voice and who maybe have quite strong personalities to be pushing and promoting such things. And these are creating controversies, and, and Timothy is, has to come in and confront these people potentially people in leadership as well. And Paul reminds Timothy that in doing this, in confronting these people, commanding them to stop, in verse 5, Paul says that the goal of this command, to make them stop, to instruct them, is love. Love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. No matter what kinds of, of conflicts may arise in doing so, uh, Timothy is to maintain love as his ultimate goal, as his ultimate motivation. You know, Paul's letter to the Ephesians was written just a few years um, prior to this letter to Timothy. Just a few years. Um, and in Ephesians 4, Paul talks to them um, how, how, how God, how Christ has given some to be different, different roles and different points of service within the church, within the body, in order to build it up uh, for the sake of the unity and the faith, uh, to be mature and to, to come to a, a measure of, of knowing the fullness of Christ so that um, we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, which is what was happening now, um, by cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Um, and Paul says, instead, in Ephesians 4.15, he says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ speaking that truth, confronting it, 
confronting um, the false, the incorrect, the false teaching, confronting it with, with love. Some time ago, I, I preached a, a sermon on, on that verse. And in it, I referred to Ephes- uh, 1 Corinthians 13, which is, which is the, the love passage, which is often used at weddings, but has nothing to do with a wedding uh, or with marriage. But what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 13 in that passage is what he's saying is that it is possible to be really religious. It is possible to know your Bible and to be moral and to be active, to be generous with your time and your money, and yet still not have love. Not to be motivated, not being motivated by love. And that is the same for us. It's the same with our relationship with, the, with God. It's the same with our relationship with each other. What is our motivation for pleasing God? Is it obligation or is it love? Listen to what Paul says uh, to the Romans in chapter 13, uh, verses 8 to 10. Paul says, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. He who loves one another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, bear false witness, not covet. If there's any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Maybe we can add a, a third purpose to the law when you look at it in, those light, in that light. Or maybe the ultimate purpose of the law is to engage us in love, in love for God, love for each other. You don't really, when you think of God's law, you don't really think of love. And yet, if we love God, if we love one another, we fulfill that law. Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples, as if you love one another. It's interesting that those who are coming up with these these teachings, these false teachings and these these myths and these uh, genealogies, um, was to promote the legalistic law was to promote it within the gospel in some way. Uh, And yet in doing so, uh, in doing so, they were defeating the very purpose of it. They were creating division, distracting from it, when what it really promotes, what the law really promotes, is love. Love out of a pure heart, meaning that love, uh, that it's a love without an ulterior motive. Love out of a good conscience, which is out of good and sincere morality, and love from a sincere faith, meaning that it is faith that is undivided, that it is a faith that is found in Christ and Christ alone. God himself saves us. God saves us, not out of obligation, not out of rule, not because it was written somewhere, but God saves us out of love. He saves us out of love. And so how can we assume to act any differently? The glorious gospel, as Paul puts it in verse 11, is based on love. And love, and that is the truth and the law. Let's pray. Father God, we we look at your truth and we see your truth in your law. And sometimes we, uh, we may not see love and yet we we read and we learn that when your word teaches us to love you and to love you and you alone um, and to love one another that we are truly fulfilling your law we thank you for our savior who paid that price on the cross who displayed your love to us by giving his life in order to pay for our sin and for our debt to you for that is true love. Great love has no, there's no greater love than for, um, for when one lays his life down for his friends. And so we thank you 
for your love given to us by giving us your son. In his name we pray, amen.